The Gathering Storm begins with Ty Lee Kerrigan. Ty Lee is one of the Sunshine Generals that helped Perrin Ivara defeat the Shadow Aiel in the previous book. As she and her Sunshine Force return to Ebudar, they are ambushed by a large force of Trollocs. At this point, she and the Sunshan thought that tales of Trollocs and other shadow spawn were just superstitions in this part of the world, but now Tylee knows that they are very much real. We then see the Forsaken Grendel as she arrives to a meeting with the other Forsaken. Grendel knows what most of the Forsaken are up to except for the Mundred. Messana tells Moradin that they must help Semirog but Moradin decides to let her suffer because she went against his orders and tried to kill Randall Thor. When Moradin asks about their preparations for the last battle, Messana tells him that she is close to breaking the White Tower and that she is gathering more and more followers. The Mandred says that his rule is secure and that he gathers for war. Moradin then tells Grendel that Rand is moving to Ara Doman and that he will try to restore order in the country, so he orders Grendel to prevent that from happening, but he reminds her not to kill Rand. Rodo Ituralda and his forces are in Ara Doman trying to defend a town from the Sunchan. So far, Ituralda and his forces have won almost every single battle against the Sunchan, so now the Sunchan no longer underestimate him. Ituralda knows that the Sunchan will try to take the town, so he hides the majority of his forces around the town. The Sunchan arrive with a force of 300,000 men and they walk into the city without suspecting a thing. Suddenly, Ituralda and his men come out of the shadows and they attack the Sunchan. In the battle, Ituralda loses over half of his 100,000 men, but in the end, he is victorious. The Prophet Masima has lost almost his entire army fighting the Shadow Aiel, so now he plans on going to Almoth Plain so he can rebuild his army. He and his men are suddenly ambushed by Fa'il and her force. The Prophet's men are immediately killed and Fa'il goes after Masima and she kills him. After defeating the Shido, Perrin managed to not only rescue his wife Fa'il but also about 100,000 Gaishan. Perrin now feels responsible for them so he takes them with him. The Ashaman are very tired after the battle and they can't make gateways so Perrin, his army, and now the refugees have to travel by foot. Perrin can feel that Rand needs him, so his objective now is to go to him. He knows that he's been avoiding the wolf dream for some time, so he decides to embrace it once again. At night, he goes into the wolf dream and he sees Hopper once again. Perrin asks him to teach him how to control the dream, but Hopper knows that Perrin is not ready to learn, so he pushes Perrin out of the dream. Avienda is still training with the Wise Ones to become one of them, but so far she is having a very strange experience. She's supposed to be learning from the Wise Ones, but all they do is punish her for no apparent reason. After some time, she finally has enough and she goes to confront the Wise Ones. She asks why she's being punished and the Wise Ones only ask her if she thinks that she is their equal. Avienda is confused by the question, but she says yes. The Wise Ones laugh and they tell her that that was the final test. All Avienda has to do to finally become a Wise One is to go to the city of Rudion and enter the glass columns. Avienda makes a gateway to the Threefold Land and she begins her journey into Rudion. Matrim Cawthorn and his band of the Red Hand are traveling through Mirindi on their way to Camelin. Matt, Tom and Noel Charon have decided to go to the Tower of Genjai to rescue Moraine, but before they do so, they need to restock on supplies. Matt learns that a town called Hinderstab is close by so he decides to go buy some supplies at this town. Matt takes Tom, Talmanis, the Aes Sedai, and some of the band to Hinderstab. 
When they arrive, they are told by the town's mayor that they may stay for just a bit, but that they must leave before sunset. Matt agrees, and so he goes to the town's tavern to gamble. He loses a lot of gold gambling, but this is exactly what he wants. As soon as the townspeople begin to feel like they can't lose, Matt bets an entire chest of gold in exchange for a bunch of supplies. Matt wins, and as he's getting his supplies, the mayor tells him that he and his friends need to leave immediately, but it is too late. As soon as the sun goes down, the townspeople go insane. They attack Matt and his men, and then they begin killing each other. Matt, the Aes Sedai, and his men try to escape the town, and as they're doing so, they have no other choice but to kill some of the townsfolk. They manage to escape the town with some prisoners, but as soon as the sun comes up, the prisoners disappear. That morning, Matt and Tom return to the town, and they find the townsfolk alive and walking around like nothing happened. The mayor tells them that for a few months now, they've been waking up every morning with a memory of what happened the night before, but they do have some idea of what happens to them at night. Tom thinks that there's a ripple in the pattern and the town unravels at night, and then the world tries to reset it each morning. Matt offers to help the town, but the mayor says no, and so Matt and Tom leave the town of Hinderstap. Back in the camp, Oliver tells Matt that someone has arrived to see him. Matt goes to see who it is, and it turns out to be Varen Mathwin. Matt asks Varen if she knows how to make a gateway, and she says yes. She tells him that she can take them to Andor immediately, but Matt is suspicious because he knows that she wants something in return. Varen offers Matt a deal. She'll take him and his band directly to Camelin on the condition that he opens and reads a letter from her 10 days after she leaves him. Matt says no because he doesn't want to owe anything to an Aes Sedai. But after further discussion, Varen offers him a better deal. Matt can choose not to open the letter and just burn it, but if he does so, he has to remain in Camelin for 30 days. Matt agrees, so Baron gives him the mysterious letter. Gawain Trakand and the younglings are still working for Elida, but lately Gawain's been having second thoughts about his service to her because he's sure that Elida tried to have him killed at Domai's Wells. When Gawain learns that Iwain has been captured by Elida, he decides to abandon the younglings and he goes to ask his former teacher, Gareth Bryn, to help him rescue her. Bryn tells him that Iwain doesn't want to be rescued, but Gawain doesn't believe it. Gareth Bryn then tells Gawain that his sister, Elaine, is now the Queen of Andor, and Gawain is very happy to hear this. Randall Thor and his forces are in Aradoman trying to restore order in the country. After capturing the forsaken Semerag, Katwin and the Aes Sedai try to interrogate her, but she refuses to talk. Katwin knows that torture won't do anything to the forsaken, so she starts thinking about another way to break Semerag. Alsalom, the king of Aradoman, has been missing for a while, and Rand thinks that Grendel kidnapped him because he is sure that Grendel has been operating in Aradoman for a while. Rand has heard of Brodo Ituralda's war against the Sonchan, and he thinks that he'll be very angry when he hears that the Dragon Reborn has invaded his homeland. Rand knows that Ituralda will make a very powerful ally, so he decides to go speak with him. Rodo Ituralda and his last remaining forces make their way to an abandoned steading. Several weeks have passed since they defeated the Sonchan, and they've heard that the Sonchan are now gathering a huge army to retake Aradoman. Ituralda knows that he cannot defeat the Sonchan, so now he and his men prepare to make their final stand at the abandoned steading. Ituralda is then told that some lord has come to see him. 
Randall Thor arrives at Rodo Ituralda's camp and he introduces himself as the Dragon Reborn. Rand tells Ituralda that he needs him in the Borderlands, but Ituralda refuses because he has orders from King Alsalom to defend Ara Doman from the Sunchan. Rand tells him that his king is most likely dead or that Grendel has him. Ituralda feels Rand's Tiberian effect and he believes him. Rand offers him a hundred Ashaman and he shows him how useful a gateway can be. Ituralda knows that he could use these Ashaman and their gateways very well, but he still refuses because he wants to save his homeland from the Sunchan. Rand promises to keep the Sunchan out of Aradoman and to restore peace in his homeland, but he wants Ituralda to defend the borderlands from the Shadow Spawn. After thinking about it, Rodo Ituralda accepts. Rand then returns to his camp and at night he goes to the World of Dreams. There he finds the men that helped him in Sharalogoth in Book 7. Rand finally recognizes him as Ishamael, but the man no longer goes by that name, he is now Morden. Morden tells Rand that the Dark One can bring anyone back from the death and that the only way to truly kill one of the Forsaken is with the Bellfire. So most of the Forsaken that Rand killed are now back in different bodies. Rand and Morden discuss Tarmungaiden and Morden tells Rand that even if he wins the last battle, the Dark One will return until he eventually wins, but Rand tells him that this time he will slay the Dark One. When Rand returns to the waking world, he finds Min reading Herod Fels' books. Min tells Rand that before Herod Fell died, he was going to tell him that in order to reseal the board to the Dark One's prison, Rand has to break all of the seals first. Katswin notices that Semerag has a huge ego, so she decides to humiliate her in order to break her. Katswin throws a plate of beans on the floor and tells Semerag to eat them. After Semerag refuses, Katwin puts her on her lap and starts spanking her. To add to the humiliation, Katwin brings in the wise ones and the servants to watch. This somehow works and Semerag finally eats the beans of the floor. Katwin has finally broken the Forsaken. During the night, Shaidar Haram appears and he helps Semerag escape. He tells her that this is her final chance. Semerag is joined by Elsa Penfall, who is an Aes Sedai and also Black Aja. Elsa gives Semerag the male Adam and she decides to use it on Rand. Rand takes Ituralda and his men to Saldea and they form a plan to defend the Borderlands. Afterwards, Rand returns to Aradoman and he goes to speak to Min. He finds Min and a serving woman in his room. Rand and Min argue about Katswin and suddenly Rand feels something around his neck. The serving woman turns out to be Semerak and the thing around his neck is the male Adam. Min is incapacitated and Rand is unable to do anything. They're then joined by Elsa, but Rand realizes that she is with Semerag. The Forsaken orders Rand to choke Min and Rand starts doing it. Min begins to cry and suddenly Rand feels some strange power within him. It is the Dark One's true power. Louis Theron tells Rand not to use it, but Rand has no other choice. He uses it to break the Adam around his neck and then he kills Elsa and Semerag with Bellfire. After this moment, Rand becomes something else. He feels no emotion and he's now willing to do whatever it takes to win. Katwin arrives to see what happened. She notices that Rand is now colder and when she sees him teaching Arishma how to make Bellfire, she tries to stop it, but Rand is no longer listening to her. Rand exiles Katwin and he tells her that if he ever sees her face again, he will kill her. Katwin begins working from behind the scenes. She hides from Rand but stays close to him. She knows that the old Rand is dying and he's becoming something else. She goes to speak to the wise ones and she tells them that she knows how they can help Rand. 
Nynaeve is investigating the death of one of King Al-Salam's messengers and she manages to track down the killer. She notices that something is blocking the killer's mind, so she takes him to Rand. Rand tells Nynaeve that the killer is under compulsion, which means that he was working for Grendel. Nynaeve manages to remove the killer's compulsion and Rand asks him where Grendel is. The killer says that she is at Netrin's Barrow and then he dies. Rand now knows Grendel's location, but before he deals with her, he goes to meet with the daughter of the Nine Moons. Tuon is in Evudar holding court. She has learned that her mother, the Empress, is dead and that the Sunshine mainland is in complete chaos. But she doesn't want to go deal with that just yet, because she knows that the last battle is coming. Tuon believes that Rand is the Dragon Reborn, so she decides to meet with him because according to the Sunshine Prophecy, the Dragon Reborn must kneel before the Crystal Throne before the last battle. Tuon and her Sunshine Generals decide to invade the White Tower. Their objective is to capture as many Aes Sedai as possible so they can make them the money and also gain the ability to make gateways. In order to accomplish this, they decide to attack the tower from the air using Rakan and Tol Rakan. They are interrupted by the arrival of Tai Lee Kurgan, who informs them of her battle against the Shido and her encounter with Trollocs. Tai Lee shows Tuan the heads of the Trollocs and now she and the Sun Chan know that Shadowspawn are real. Tuan and Rand agree to meet at Falma and they begin to negotiate a treaty but it does not go well. Rand tells Tuan that they must unite against the Shadow and fight together at the last battle and Tuan agrees with him but she tells him that he should unite his lands under the Sunshine Banner. Rand says no and he tells her that she must sign a peace treaty and for a moment she begins to feel Rand's Tiberian effect. She's about to say yes but she manages to resist and says no instead. Rand gets up and then he leaves. At that moment, Tuon is terrified of Rand. Tuon tells her generals that Rand and his forces cannot be allowed to gain any more strength, so she decides to invade the White Tower as soon as possible. In the White Tower, Iwain Alvier is still trying to undermine Elida. One night, Elida invites Iwain to her room to have dinner and when Iwain arrives, she finds Meidani already there. Meidani is a rebel Aes spy and during the dinner, Iwain realizes that Elida knows this, so she is just trying to mess with both of them. As the dinner goes on, Iwain grows more and more frustrated with Elida. When Elida mentions adding an oath of obedience to the three oaths, Iwain is about to explode, but she knows that that's what Elida wants. So instead, Iwain drops her bowl of soup on the floor, so Elida sends Iwain to the Mistress of Novices to be punished. After this encounter with Elida, Iwain realizes that she doesn't have to undermine Elida anymore because Elida, with all of her failures and terrible plans, is doing it to herself. So Iwain's mission now is to unite the tower once again and just wait for Elida to destroy herself. She goes to speak with Meidani and she asks her why she didn't flee the White Tower after Elida found out that she was a spy, but Meidani refuses to answer. Iwain realizes that an oath is preventing Meidani from answering, so Iwain tells Meidani to show her instead. Meidani makes a gateway to the basement of the White Tower and there they find Siane, Jukiri, and Cyrene. Iwain realizes that the reason why Meidani couldn't answer her question was because this group of Aes Sedai placed a fourth oath on Meidani. After Iwain speaks to them, she learns that they are hunting the Black Aja within the White Tower. Iwain agrees with their mission, but she doesn't agree with putting a fourth oath on an Aes Sedai. Iwain asks them if any of the sitters turned out to be Black Aja and the Black Aja hunters say that one of them was Black Aja. Iwain tells them that this means that Elida is not the true Amorlin because she only became the Amorlin by one boat. 
and it was a black Aja boat. The black Aja hunters realized that this is true, so they agreed to work with Iwain. Elida invites Iwain to dinner once again, but this time there's multiple Aes Sedai in attendance. Throughout the dinner, Elida tries to provoke Iwain. She insults the rebel Aes Sedai. Iwain speaks up and she tells everyone that she is a dreamer and that she dreamt that the Sun Channel will attack the White Tower at some point. But Elida calls her a liar. Iwain finally has enough, so she reveals Elida's plan to add an oath of obedience to the Three Oaths. After a long argument, Elida loses control and she attacks Iwain with the One Power. The rest of the Aes Sedai stop Elida and after Iwain recovers, Elida throws her in a cell and declares her a dark friend. After some time, Elida releases Iwain from her cell and she announces that the person responsible for Iwain's bad behavior is the mistress of novices, Silviana Brihan. Silviana is to be stilled and executed, but Iwain convinces the Red Sisters accompanying her to go try to stop this because Silviana's execution will break the Red Aja. The Red Sisters give Iwain Forkroot and then they allow her to go to her room alone. In her room, she finds Varen waiting for her. Iwain tells Varen that she has a lot of work to do and she can't speak to her, but to get Iwain's attention, Varen does something that no true Aes Sedai can do. She lies. She tells Iwain that she's wearing a green dress when she clearly isn't. Varen then tells her that she's had the three oats removed and that she is of the Black Aja. Varen joined the Black Aja because she was caught by them, so she was given a choice to join them or die. She decided to join them and since then, Varen has been studying the forces of the shadow from within. One of the oaths Varen made to the Dark One is that she cannot betray him until the hour of her death. So Varen is now drinking poison and betraying the Dark One. Before she dies, she gives Iwain two books. One is a key to translate the second book, which contains all of Varen's studies, like a list of all the Black Aja sisters that Varen has managed to find. Finally, she tells Iwain that the Forsaken Messana is operating from within the White Tower, but she doesn't know her identity. As Varen is dying, she tells Iwain that she doesn't want to be remembered as a Black Aja, but as a Brown Aja. Iwain promises that she will. After Varen passes away, Iwain spends hours studying Varen's book and she learns that over 200 Aes Sedai are Black Aja. She contacts the Black Aja hunters and she tells them to arrest and test Alvarin because she is Black Aja. She then goes to Telaranriad to meet with Swan Sanche and she tells her to watch out for Shiriam because she is also Black Aja. Suddenly, Iwain feels that someone is trying to wake her up, so she returns to the real world and she finds an Accepted trying to wake her up. The Accepted tells Iwain that they're under attack and then Iwain spots from the window a flying serpent in the sky and she realizes that it is the Sun Chan. Iwain gathers the novices and she teaches them how to link with one another and form circles. She then goes to the White Tower's storeroom and she takes the Vora's Wand Saangriel, which is the most powerful Saangriel the White Tower has. With this Saangriel, Iwain and the novices go out to face the Sun Chan and they manage to push them back, but unfortunately, the White Tower is very underprepared for this kind of attack and the Sun Chan achieve their objective and they enslave a lot of Aes Sedai and then they retreat. After the attack, Iwain sends the novices to their rooms and then she passes out. She hears the voices of Swan, Gareth Bryn and Gawain. Gawain carries Iwain away and they take her back to the rebel Aes Sedai camp. Swan Sanche knew that Iwain was in trouble after she left Telaranriad very suddenly. So with the help of Gareth Bryn and Gawain, they managed to sneak into the White Tower and now they think that they're rescuing Iwain. When Iwain wakes up in the rebel camp, she is furious with Swan Sanche and Gawain for rescuing her. 
She knows that she was very close to winning her war against Elida, but now she thinks that Elida will have her executed if she returns to the White Tower. She was able to take the Oathroth from the White Tower, so she goes ahead with a new plan. She orders a meeting with all of the Revel Aes Sedai setters, and in front of them she swears the three oaths. She then tells them that they all have to re-swear the three oaths to confirm that none of them are Black Aja. As Ewen says this, she feels Shiriam embracing the source. Ewen immediately shields her and she tricks her into saying a lie, which confirms that she is Black Aja. Ewen then reveals that she knows the names of over 70 Black Aja sisters in the rebel camp, so she proposes a plan to capture them. After a long process, the rebel Aes Sedai capture and execute many of the Black Aja, but some of them do manage to escape. Ewen knows that the White Tower is in a very weak state and she's determined to bring down Elida, so she orders Gareth Bryn and his army to begin an assault on the tower. But before the assault can begin, the White Tower Aes Sedai send a delegation to speak to Ewen. The delegation tells Ewen that the White Tower Aes Sedai have selected her as the new Amarlin seat because Elida was taken by the Sanchan during the attack. Ewen accepts and after a ceremony, Ewen officially becomes the Amarlin seat to the entire White Tower. Finally, we go back to Rand. After not being able to make peace with the Sanchan, Randall Thor decides to go deal with Grendel, who's hiding in a place called the Natron's Barrow. He takes Min, Nynaeve, and Lord Ramshalan with him, and he sends Ramshalan to go speak with Grendel. Rand knows that Grendel will send Ramshalan back under heavy compulsion, but that's exactly what Rand wants, because he wants to make sure that Grendel is in Natron's Barrow. When Ramshalan returns, Nynaeve confirms that he is under heavy compulsion. So Rand destroys Netran's barrow, which is full of innocent people, with Bellfire. Then he asks Nynaeve if Ramshalan is still under compulsion and Nynaeve says no. Rand thinks that his plan worked and Grendel is finally dead. Nynaeve and Min think that Rand is out of control, so they decide to go ask Katswain for help. Katswain is already working on something to help Rand and she tells Nynaeve that in order to help him, she needs to find a parent. After not being able to bring peace to Arad Doman, Rand decides to leave the country and he returns to Tyr. Rand now wants to focus on the Borderlands and the last battle, so he goes to meet with the Borderlander army that has been looking for him. The Borderlanders send Hurin as a messenger. Hurin is the Borderlander that has the ability to smell violence and he accompanied Rand to Falma in Book 2. Hurin tells Rand that the Borderlanders want to meet with him in Farmatting because in Farmatting, Rand is unable to channel. Rand says no and he gives Hurin a message for the Borderlanders. He says that he can take them back to the Borderlands or they can stay in Farmatting and not take part in the last battle. Then he returns to Tyr and Nynaeve asks him where Perrin is. Rand tells Nynaeve where he is and Nynaeve goes back to Katwin and she tells her that she knows Perrin's location. Katwin reveals that they do not need Perrin but they do need someone that is traveling with him. Rand is still angry with the Sunchan for refusing to make a deal with him so he decides to use the Chorankal against them and drive them back into the ocean. As he's getting ready to go attack the Sunchan, he finds his father, Tamal Thor, in his room. Rand is very happy to see him and the two have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation, but after Rand learns that Katwin sent Tam to speak to him, he feels like Katwin is once again trying to manipulate him, so he grows furious and loses control. He attacks and almost kills his own father, but after he sees Tam's terrified face, he escapes through a gateway. Rand goes to Ebudar by himself, determined to destroy the Sunchan. He's very disturbed by the fact that he almost killed his own father. 
Rand gets ready to attack the Sonchen and he sees his Sidene, but he suddenly gets very sick and begins vomiting. He decides to flee and he goes to the place where Louis Theron died, Dragon Mount. On top of Dragon Mount, Rand thinks about all the decisions that have led him to this moment. Through the Chorankao, he seizes as much Sidene as he possibly can and he wonders what the point of it all is. The pattern keeps repeating itself and he's destined to fight again and again and make everyone suffer. He closes his eyes and decides to destroy the entire pattern and end everything but then Louis Theron talks to him. He tells Rand that maybe the reason they live again and again is so that they can have a second chance and fix their mistakes. Rand realizes that to live again is also to love again. He is now determined to make things right. He opens his eyes and he knows that he will never again hear Louis Theron's voice for they were not two men and never had been. He looks up at the sky and sees the sun. Then for the first time in a long time, he begins to laugh.